Okay, welcome to uh, another cold uh, demonstration at City Square. Uh, my name is Sally Kincaid and I'm a retired teacher, member of the National Education Union and Palestinian Solidarity Campaign. I don't know about anybody else, but the, the, the horror, the absolute horror of what's going on can sometimes feel so overwhelming that it's very, very hard to know what to do. Which is exactly why we're doing what we're doing today. We're doing what to do today. We'll listen to some speeches. We'll have some chants, etc. We're not marching today, but we will be marching next week, and we will be marching the week after. So I'm giving the police notification now. It will be in writing and sent to you the required, required um, term that we need. That we will carry on marching until Palestine is free. We are not prepared to have this done in our name, any time, ever. Last night I went to the Medics for Palestine Vigil, which will be happening again in a fortnight in Millennium Square. And I listened to a speech by a lecturer, I'm hoping she's here somewhere, because I'm hoping she's going to do, Mary, Dr. Marianne's going to do the speech, similar speech. But she talked about the horror in terms of public health, about meningitis, about septicemia, about everything, that, the, just the horror, the horror. And I'm saying this now, that we will carry on from the river to the sea until Palestine will be free. Or in Leeds, from the Pennines to the sea, Palestine will be free. Now, I'm going to introduce the first, I've got a few speakers on my little scrap of paper, so I'm going to introduce Shane to come forward to speak first, if that's okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, firstly, I'm sure I speak for everyone when I express it total condemnation for the return of violence to Palestine once again. It's clear, I think, that Israel were interested only in freeing their, their people and in trying to hoodwink world opinion into seeing them as anything other than bloodthirsty oppressors, bringing murder and genocide to the Palestinian people. And now the mask has slipped again. Now we see the Israeli war machine come back to life and now we see death and destruction all over again. I was shocked to see the apathy of world leaders to Israel's first onslaught of this present campaign but the optimist in me was quite sure that once a truce was announced and once a relative peace returned to Palestine the world would not allow the Israeli regime to rain death on the Palestinian people once again. If it is at all possible, I feel that our condemnation of those who aid and abet the Israeli regime should be stronger than ever now. On the previous occasions that I've had the honour to speak to you all here, I've drawn links to Ireland. Our solidarity with the Palestinian people is long-standing and we genuinely feel a strong affinity with you and your cause. I think it's always fraught with danger to try and draw equivalence between the experiences of different peoples across the world and across time. But we feel that our own history of oppression, occupation and genocide gives us at least an appreciation for the Palestinian experience. So the links between the Irish and the Palestinians are often spoken about and are hopefully familiar to most people. What mightn't be as well known is our links, unfortunate as they are, with the Israeli regime. Now, first off, if we have any decent, well-meaning Israeli people present in the crowd, or those of a Jewish faith, or even those of an Eastern European heritage, I'm going to have to say some names now, and I must apologize for the pronunciations. I'm almost 100% certain to get them wrong. At the turn of the last century, there was a Polish-born man named Yitzhak Halevi, apologies, Herzog. 
in one of those very strange coincidences that link all the people of the world, Herzog at one point moved with his family to right here in Leeds. He probably stood where we all stand right now. Eventually he ended up in Ireland where he held the post of Chief Rabbi. He was a public and prominent supporter of the Irish Revolutionary cause and was indeed a friend and acquaintance of several of our prominent revolutionaries at and around the time of the Irish War of Independence, one of the major conflicts in our struggle for liberation. The media coined the, ter coined the term the Sinn Féin Rabbi to describe him, the Sinn Féin of that day being the political voice of Revolutionary Ireland. And Herzog had a son while he was living in Ireland, a man named Chime Herzog, a bona fide Irish-born and bred man who would later become the president of the Israeli occupation. In turn, he would have a son named Isaac. Isaac Herzog, the current president of the same Israeli occupation. And Isaac gave an interview to Irish television during the week. He was responding to the comments of the Taoiseach, or Prime Minister, Leo Varadkar, in relation to the release of Emily Hand, one of the Israeli hostages. Isaac felt that Varadkar was not strong enough in his condemnation of Hamas and the kidnapping. He said, and I quote, What is the problem with admitting the truth? What did we do that Ireland is so indifferent? Well, Isaac, if I were to admit the truth to you, I would tell you that we are not at all indifferent. We actually feel very strongly about this whole situation. We would condemn you, your regime, your occupation of another's land and your ongoing campaign of genocide in the strongest terms imaginable. And he said that he is proud of his Irish lineage. Well, we can't say that we are necessarily proud of our links to you. And I would question how you could possibly be truly proud of your heritage. Central to Irish identity is a compassion for those suffering from the effects of oppression and occupation. Irish sympathies have long sided with those who are punching up, not those punching down. I reject your claim to be proud of your Irish heritage because I see nothing in your words or actions to show me that you understand the experience. Call for an immediate ceasefire and use your position and influence to direct the extremists in your regime to find a settlement with the Palestinian people that allows for their freedom and liberty. And you may start to convince us. Until then, we care little for you and your supposed pride in an Irish heritage. Herzog's comments were spoken in relation to another link between Ireland and Palestine, and that is Emily Hand. Emily is a young Irish Israeli girl, one of those released during the week. I truly hope I speak for everyone when I say that I am absolutely delighted and relieved that she is safe and okay. She's a little girl who has harmed no one. She has not attacked anyone. I'm glad she's okay, and I wish her all the best. Emily is one nine-year-old in the middle of this horror. In amongst all of the relief and celebration at her release, it might be hard to appreciate just how many Emily Hands there are in this horror. How many Palestinian children have suffered? How many will not know the relief of seeing their families again? Either because their family are dead or they are dead. Surely the response to Emily's release should be a renewed effort to make sure that we do not see more and more children affected. If we truly wish to ensure that we never see such a situation again, the only way is to reach a lasting settlement which cuts out the root cause of all violence in Palestine. A ceasefire will be great, but it's not enough. A permanent peace based on a recognition of Palestinian liberty and freedom is the only way we can protect the Emily hands of Palestine and the area known as Israel. I'd like to finish up today by once again acknowledging the bravery of the Palestinian people as they face further horror. Your refusal to give up on your nationhood and your right to liberty and freedom is so striking. I will close by reading a short passage from the Declaration of the Irish Republic, read on the steps of the GPO, the headquarters of the Easter Rising, 1916. We declare the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland and to the unfettered control of Irish destinies to be sovereign and indefeasible. 
The long usurpation of that right by a foreign people and government has not extinguished the right, nor can it ever be extinguished except by the destruction of the Irish people. The Irish people have never been destroyed, and the Palestinian people shall never be destroyed. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shane. I'm now going to introduce Joanne from Women in Black, who can tell you about Women in Black. I'm now going to invite Ishma to, to speak, to pronounce his name right, and I'm holding his flag while, in case it breaks. Okay, thank you. Asalaamu As Alaikum, uh, my name is Jawad, and, uh, and I'm a student at Beckett, and I've, I've spoken here a few times now. And uh, many of you might see me on Wednesday in parking steps when I spoke then. I wish I could say something passionate, inspiring for a few, but I'm not here today in any sort of happiness. I'm here in anger, I'm upset, I'm distraught because the moment that this lying ceasefire ended, Israel continued their bombing immediately. And I was on the phone with a friend of mine who's Palestinian as we both sat there in our individual homes watching Al Jazeera news and we saw the rain of bombs being dropped on Gaza and it broke me but I could hear him crying over the other end because it's a home he's never known it's a home he's never been to he's been a refugee his entire life because his grandma was forced to flee to Jordan and to Iraq during the Nakba his parents born in Iraq, so was he. When he was young, he had to flee Iraq when Americans had to drop bombs on Iraq as well. His grandma fled in Nakba as a five-year-old girl, fleeing from destruction and from death, just for a fleeting hope to survive. And could you imagine her horror when her grandchild has to suffer the same fate, fleeing to another country? He went from Iraq to Cyprus to Turkey and now he's in the UK but he's still unable to go back to the home that he's always known that he's always lived in and last week when I spoke at Parkinson Steps I was adamant that this is a genocide it is an occupation it is an apartheid yet for some reason Zionists walked up 
the people after the crowd dispersed and said, there is no genocide, there's no occupation, there's no apartheid. Now I'm a student who does history. I thought I might as well come here and inform people that there, it, this is exactly what I say it is. There's a historian called Lemkin who founded the term genocide. And there's three things that make a one day genocide. Bureaucracy, ideology, and technologies of death. We know the ideology that Zionists have. Zionism, an ethnic state based on only Jewish supremacy to wipe out Palestinians from their land. We know what they want. They want a one state solution based on blood and tyranny. We know that they have technologies of death. We've seen them. We've seen the joint direct attack munitions su supplied by America. We've seen them use white phosphorus. We've seen them use warplanes and tanks. Things the Palestinians have zero access to. We see the bureaucracies. We see how they have companies like Makator, which block all water. They say that there's no occupation. They say there's no genocide. But with the three foundations to make a modern genocide, they've already killed 20,000 people. They say that there's no occupation. But we've seen the statistics surpass that of the 1948 Nakba. The Nakba had 750,000 people displaced and 15,000 people killed. We have 20,000 people killed now. 1.7 million displaced. The entirety of the north is rubble. 51% of all homes in Gaza are no longer able to be lived in because they're just rocks on the ground and they can't even return because we saw during the ceasefire the moment they tried to go back to the north they were shot and killed and they didn't even count for the West Bank 200 people killed in the West Bank <laughs> it, it makes me just think how can they sit there and say there's no occupation when order 158 of the IDF straight up says that the, that the Palestinian people have no ability or permit to make any sort of water infrastructure. Water! The basic necessity for human life! Save! 77 litres per, per 1,000 people go into Gaza. The World, the World Health Organization says that you need 100 litres per thousand people to survive. The Israelis get 300 litres per thousand people. You need a permit, a permit to even have water. And you can't even get a permit. And the IDF has the apparent legal jurisdiction to wipe out any attempt to make wells or rain catchers. Their laws even say that the rain that falls from the sky is owned by them. So they own rain, they own water, they let food go in on their own via volition. They shouldn't be allowed to do any of that. We're blessed to have the water. I can turn on the tap right now, leave it on as long as I'm here. Go back, it's not a dent in my pocket. They have to ration their water. We've not seen rationing of food or rationing of water since the days of World War II when this country faced rationing as German, German bombers and German warships destroyed supply lines. We're not in World War II. We're not in a global crisis. But they're facing a global crisis in their very own homes for a hundred years! They should have to live like that. We're blessed to not be able to have to live like that. But my friend isn't blessed. He can't go back home. He can never walk the streets of Nablus or Tantura where his family came from. His village no longer exists where his family came from. Because Israel wiped it all off, put trees over it. So there was no existence of Palestinian villages. They say it's not a genocide, but they're wiping out culture. They say it's not a genocide, but they've wiped out 20,000 people. They say it's not occupation, but historic Palestine only has 15% of its land remaining. They say that there's no apartheid, but Nelson Mandela himself, the guy who fought against South African apartheid, even he said it. So they just get denied the words of great leaders, fighters, who stood on the lines and the frontier against discrimination. 
and they want to keep us divided. It was division that let the British rule over my country for hundreds of years before we united and liberated ourselves. It was division that kept the South Africans from going, from truly letting free the shackles of apartheid. But it was unity from Nelson Mandela and from people in this country in the 90s who protested and boycotted to get the South African government to free themselves and rid the apartheid system. It was the vision that had the black people, the African Americans, be held in segregation and this discrimination for years. But it was unity for the words of Malcolm X, for the words for the words of Martin Luther King and the actions of Rosa Parks that allowed the civil rights movement to break free and actually give proper rights to the African American people. But what hurts me is that a lot of people here have boycott fatigue. I've seen people, Muslims even, who will go and buy a can of coke or they'll go back to Starbucks. Shame on you for branding yourself with such co corporations that allow these things to happen. When Rosa Parks refused to get up from the bus, Martin Luther King had a 381 day ban on buses. They walk to wherever they go. You know, even move that stone in your hand. Fix yourselves. Because unless we don't fix ourselves, we will never ever fix the situation in Palestine. That's what we want. Free, free! from the Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've seen what's happened since the so-called ceasefire ended. Israel has killed hundreds of people in 24 hours. Hundreds of people killed in 24 hours. They've driven 1.7 million people out of their homes in northern central Gaza. They were hiding, in, hiding taking refuge in Khan Yunis in the south of 